Insofar, firstly, as it does not seem to be a cause of suffering for Joyce, but rather of enjoyment. And secondly, that the Joycean centum, spelt S-I-N-T-H-O-M-E, is precisely not meant to be read, as in some sense unreadable, so in that sense it's not a message to the other. He thus positions the writing of James Joyce, a latent psychotic, as yielding new knowledge on the neurotic symptom, which leads Lacan no longer to consider it as in any straightforward sense pathological, and which should be entirely eradicated through the interpretation of its message in analytic treatment, but rather, as uh, clinician Véronique Vorus succinctly puts it, structural, a necessary residue of the very fact that we speak. In short, with the encounter with Joyce's writing comes for Lacan the possibility of transforming the symptom into something positive, which will give Lacan in time a new formulation for the end of analysis, namely not the liquidation of the symptom, but a kind of know-how, that is savoir-faire, on making do, that is savoir-y-faire, with the symptom, and even the identification therewith. So it's now, following the encounter with Joyce, that Lacan's consideration of literature sees a shift away from literary creativity as symptom, as he had theorised it in the late 50s in Seminar 7, towards literature as symptom. Sorry, did I say literary, away from literary creativity as sublimation, as he had theorised it in Seminar 7, towards literature as symptom. And here, by symptom, Lacan no longer understands a ciphered message addressed to the other, but rather, according to a new definition thereof, given in Seminar 20, 22, I quote, the way in which each subject enjoys his unconscious insofar as it determines him. Moreover, what Lacan calls Joyce's symptom, according to an archaic orthography of symptom, is of the order of what he calls the not that, understood according to the collocation anything but not that. So the symptom is that which is most intimate, most precious to the subject, and upon which she will not yield for anything, something with which she most closely identifies as testifying to the mode of enjoyment proper to her, that is, to her singularity. So obviously, there's a lot more that could be said on Joyce and the symptom, but we'll move on to Beckett. So given all of this, it's striking that although Lacan says nowhere near as much about Samuel Beckett as he does about any of the writers thus far mentioned, particularly Joyce, both of the two brief mentions Lacan does make of Beckett occur in the run-up to and concurrently with his early engagement with Joyce, and specifically in contexts where Lacan is attempting to think through the question of in what psychoanalysis consists, and particularly its end point. It's also noteworthy, I think, that whilst Lacan's allusions to Beckett in one sense conform to his tendency to identify creative writers as possessing a knowledge that either coincides with or can advance that of psychoanalysis, there is one exceptional feature to the Beckett references. Here, rhetorically at least, Lacan positions the Beckettian text as a site of knowledge, but with Lacan himself, rather than Beckett, on the side of the analysand. So the first time Lacan name-checks Beckett is on November 13th, 1968, in the opening session to Seminar 16, entitled From Another to Another, and it really is no more than a passing allusion. Lacan has just announced the theme for the year's work as the theorisation of psychoanalysis as discourse, that is, as social link, and the political consequences attaching to its psychoanalysis emergence, both at the precise historical juncture at which Freud first made his discoveries, that is, after Hegel, and in the contemporary period, that is, in the late 60s, just after the events of May 68. Uh, Lacan opens by writing a succinct definition of psychoanalytic discourse on the board, uh, no, it's not that. Anyway, sorry. Uh, the essence of psycholytic theory is a discourse without speech. And we'll return to this later. He then goes on to make a brief acknowledgement of uh, someone called François Verle, the editor of Lacan's recently published Écrit, for having both put these writings of Lacan into circulation, along with those contemporaries known at the time as structuralists, and for having secured a new venue for his seminar. Lacan refers to Val here, tongue-in-cheek, as a publiciste, publicist, and goes on to say that being lumped, or rather dumped in, with these fellow structuralists is perhaps no bad thing. I quote, I've just spoken of a publiciste, a publicist. Everyone knows the wordplay I've indulged in around publication. Now, poubelle is the French for dustbin, publication, publication. And so here we all are in the same dustbin by whose grace we have our weekly service. 
there's worse company to be in. In truth, those with whom, with whom I find myself conjoined here being only people whose work I hold in the highest esteem, I cannot consider myself badly off. As for the dustbin, that is poubelle, in these times dominated by the genius of Samuel Beckett, we know a bit about that. Personally, having inhabited three psychoanalytic societies over the last 30 years, in three stints of 15, 10 and 5 years, I know a bit about what it is to cohabit with household waste. So, these well-known puns to which Lacan here refers, on the near homophony in French between publication and publication, that's publication, publication, publishing as rubbishing, we might say, are the kinds of humorous throwaway remarks, no pun intended, by which Lacan often betrays a little joycy and anxiety as to the longevity of his work. Whether his écrit would merely be consigned to the dustbin of psychoanalytic history, or whether they would succeed in doing anything. This anxiety is all the more clear here for the fact that Beckett is evoked in terms that reference his recent consecration by the Nobel Prize Committee. Um, if the times are ones dominated by the genius of Samuel Beckett, it's presumably because the announcement of his having been awarded the Nobel Prize for the year 1969 had just been made the month before. And so if Beckett's name crops up here, it's perhaps in part uh, because he's a writer whose star has definitively risen from disciple status as a member of Joyce's circle, uh, while similar recognition for Lacan's work relative to Freud still eludes him. These puns on publication, however, also no doubt owe a little something to Joyce's equivocation between letter and litter in the wake, and thus evoke a theoretical question that's becoming increasingly insistent in Lacan's teaching of this time, namely that of the doing of analysis as clinical practice, and particularly of what an analysis pur purports to be able to do at its end with regards to the poubelle of the unconscious, and the symptom as message. In the seminar of the previous year, seminar 15, Lacan had offered his first theorization of the end of analysis, from which he borrows the terms of his reference to Beckett as someone who knows a little something about the poubelle. In seminar 15, Lacan sets down his understanding of the point at which someone enters analysis as an entry into the transferential relation of analysand to analyst where the analyst is cast in the role of the subject supposed to know something about the symptoms of which the analysand complains, and who is apt to make it all better, as it were. If the analysis aims at the production of truth, however, it is not one of which the analyst is the repository, and which he dispenses to the analysand as might a master to a disciple. Rather, Lacan formulates the end of analysis here as predicated upon the dissolution of this transferential relation of analysand to analyst, in terms that amount to the liquidation, or rather elimination, of the analyst as she or he who knows. And so at this stage in Lacan's teaching, analysis aims at disinterring the residue, remains or leftovers that animate the subject via the symptom, and it does so by deposing or eliminating the subject supposed to know. This elimination, moreover, is to be understood quite literally, for Lacan describes the process of analysis as one of the production of dishu, that is litters, in the interest of what we might think of as the trashing of the subject supposed to know. In other words, as Lacan goes on to put it somewhat less decorously still, the end of analysis is marked by the analysand's rejection of the analyst as a turd. So from this, we can glean that when Lacan evokes Beckett in the opening session to Seminar 16 as someone who has something to tell, teach us about the poubelle, He's following his tendency to situate literary authors as being in possession of a knowledge that either coincides with or advances that of psychoanalysis, but it is also rhetorically positioning Beckett as a kind of subject supposed to know, rather as the analysand does the analyst at the start of an analysis. As we will see, he goes on to do something a little uh, fairly similar a little over three years later, this time incorporating a good deal of his teaching over the intervening period not simply on analysis as clinical practice, but also a social link. That is, as he writes it here in Seminar 16, as a discourse without speech. So, this second occasion where Beckett gets a mention is on May the 12th, 1971, in Seminar 18, entitled Of a Discourse That Would Not Be of Semblance, in the session that was to be written, uh, published in written form as the text I've already mentioned, Literateur. It's mainly to the written version that I'll refer here. The context is, once again, a discussion of psychoanalysis as discourse, of the status of the letter, and of James Joyce. 
Lacan opens by justifying the eponymous neologism littérateur, with reference firstly to the Joycean equivocation from Finnegan's Wake, and secondly, a little recreational etymology. I quote. Uh, the word owes its legitimacy, the word that is littérateur, owes its legitimacy to the Ernaud and Maillet, lino, litura, litorarus. Danny Nobus has followed up Lacan's references to the French etymological dictionary of Latin, whose authors, Ernaud and Maillet, inform us that as Lacan himself acknowledges more explicitly in the seminar than in the published text, the association of letters as, and litters is a witticism of Joyce's and Lacan's, entirely devoid of etymological justification. The Latin litera, which gives us both the French littérature and the English literature, refers to, I quote, a letter of the alphabet, a written character, all kinds of written work, literature, culture and instruction. Lino and litum, single T, on the other hand, mean respectively to coat and a coating, which produce in turn subsidiary meanings of deletion, correction, erasure and spot or stain. The last word that Lacan invites us to look up, litorarius, means that which shows the lesions, which is homophonic, homophonic with litorarius, meaning shore or coast, and gives us the French littoral, that means coast. Lacan says quite clearly in Seminar 18 that he couldn't care less that letters and litters have, historically speaking, nothing to do with one another. What interests him is rather the slippage that Joyce makes between the two that can occur in speech through their near homophony in English, and that, in turn, between that which shows deletions and shoreline in Latin that provides him with a pun of his own. What interests Lacan here is thus really what Joyce is doing when he makes that pun in Finnegan's Wake, just as what interested him about Poe back in 56 was what Poe was doing as a writer in formulating such a message about the letter. Now that doing, in Joyce's case, is something Lacan here terms faire litière la lettre, literally to make a litter of the letter, and goes on rhetorically and somewhat obscurely to wonder whether that is something Joyce owes to Thomas Aquinas. The French expression faire litière la lettre is rather ambiguous. Translatable as to litter or to make litter of, it is often taken in readings of this piece to mean simply to reduce to 